I'm Tony Burchard, president of the Virginia Hospital Center Foundation. Thank you for joining us for this week's huddle. The stakeholders huddle is facilitated by the Virginia Hospital Center Foundation as a way to share current information regarding the hospital's COVID-19 response. If you are logged into WebEx, please join the chat by emailing your questions or comments. And if you've called in and want to ask a question, please email to foundation at virginiahospitalcenter.com. We will answer as many questions as possible after hearing from our clinical leaders. So let's get started. I'd like to introduce Melody Dickerson, the Chief Nursing Officer for Virginia Hospital Center. Thanks for joining us, Melody. And um, I wanted to start off our conversation today um, talking about um, our COVID patients here at Virginia Hospital Center. You know, the national media has a tendency to focus um, on how many people are infected and then unfortunately how many people die. And one of the things I've noticed that we're doing here at the hospital is that we're flipping the script and we're actually focusing on how many patients are recovering. So can you speak to that? Yeah, I think, um, you know, certainly this virus is an interesting phenomenon and, and um, it can have really negative outcomes, but I think it's important for staff and, and the entire care team and um, even all of you to really appreciate that the vast, vast majority of people um, do recover and, um, and live on, you know, to have very productive lives. So I pulled some data I thought might be helpful to this group and, and uh, in, in keeping with the theme of, of our board that we share with our staff every day is, you know, we had 20 patients who were discharged from the hospital that were COVID positive just yesterday. Um, in the last five days, we've discharged 96 patients. And these were patients that actually left and went home. So not to a long-term care facility or some other acute facility. These are people that are going home, back to their families, back to their communities, um, you know, getting ready to live their lives. And we've had um, four patients this week that were on ventilator assistance that are no longer on the ventilator. So, you know, all these things are a testament to the, to the great work that our physicians and nurses are doing. I think it's just really exciting. And I know Dr. Galicia will, will get into this more. Um, the Redisavir trial. Um, today, we are actually starting um, the um, convalescent uh, serum uh, therapy, which is another promising treatment for this. Uh, so, you know, we really are on the cutting edge of medicine here. And, um, you know, I think our, our outcomes, our patient outcomes are really showing that. That's fantastic. Um, thank you for sharing that. I noticed um, we get a lot of calls at the foundation, people wanting to give. You know, it's the same. We've been very pleased with how the community's rallied. But, you know, one thing that Arlington residents are really making sure of is that our healthcare workers and their families are being well fed. Could you speak to that? Yeah, the staff have been um, so very appreciative of all the gifts of, of, um, of food that have gone to the units. We uh, have jokingly said that um, COVID-19, we're all gonna remember the 19 pounds that we gained um, <laughs> <laughs> during this, uh, the, during this uh, crisis. Uh, but you know, it's, it's really nice that, you know, as hard as these folks are working, that you know they don't have to go stand in line in the cafeteria and get food. And we really have been very intentional to to um, to give these gifts to those that are literally on the front line. Um, about you know uh, half of the hospital right now are, are are COVID designated areas, and the other half of the hospital are taking care of all the other patients that are here for all the other reasons that people came to the hospital all the time for. And so um, you know to really take those folks that are. You know, constantly wearing not not just the mask that that I'm wearing, but um, wearing the N95 mask that you probably learned a lot about over the the media attention, um, and you know all the other PPE and going in and out of these rooms constantly. It's really nice to be able to give them uh, this this gift of just one less thing they have to worry about. You know, we've actually had 3,700. Um, gifts of food uh, and donations wow. made. Yeah, it's it's quite amazing, and um, so uh, and I think a gift this week that we're we're planning to give, where um, we can actually give specific 
gift of, of a meal to a family of a healthcare worker. And so we're extremely thankful for that. I can't wait to distribute that next week. We're getting our list of names and, and who will um, be able to do that for. But, you know, that gives us an opportunity to also take care of those unsung heroes that are also in the fray of it. I think about our environmental services folks that are going in these rooms to clean. Um, who have never never had to do any of this before. So it'd be really nice to be able to do that um, for for those and the respiratory therapists and and all the other folks that uh, really make it possible for us to give the best care. That's fantastic. So, Melody, you mentioned there's patients in the hospital that are not COVID nineteen positive. Of course, we're not really hearing much about that, but certainly um, there's other healthcare needs that are going on. And in fact, um, there's a possibility that um, as soon as April 25th, here in Virginia, that we'll be allowed to have other patients uh, that would be classified as elected procedures, that they would be permitted to come back to the hospital. So what would you tell a patient um, who is considering having, you know, a procedure, a hip replacement, knee replacement, something like that? What would you tell a patient um, around safety uh, and having that kind of procedure coming back right after the COVID-19 experience? Yeah. So um, I think, you know, the hospital is doing a lot of things right now to make sure that um, that we keep our employees and our patients safe. And um, that's on the on the COVID designated units and all other areas of the hospital. Um, you know, we've severely limited our, um, just the campus itself. Um, today, visitors are not allowed. Um, for the most part, we uh, we really are at a point where visitors are allowed if it's a life, someone giving birth, um, they're allowed to obviously have a support person with them as they're giving birth and, and during that hospital stay and, uh, and at death. So if someone is certainly at end of life, then we'll make every attempt we can to, to make sure that they, you know, have a family member um, at the bedside um, so that they can say their goodbyes. Um, all of the visitors are, are really prohibited from the hospital right now. Um, and so, um, you know, while there are always elective cases, um, you know, at the end of the day, these, these patients have been waiting um, weeks now to have these procedures done. So um, sometimes more harm will be caused if, if the procedure just isn't done. So let's take a a knee replacement surgery for an example of that. Um, you know, if you're at the point where you need to have that surgery done, to have to wait another month, more muscle deteriorates, more bone deteriorates, and the success of the, of the, um, Dr. Uh, the success of that uh, surgery um, could be impeded just by that weight. So um, I would say that, you know, the risk to the, to the patient is extremely low at this point. Um, we are uh, uh, very soon going to be um, starting to test all our patients as they come in. And so these patients, we would definitely be testing to make sure that we don't accidentally bring someone in who's asymptomatic, uh, who could uh, uh, unknowingly expose one of our um, employees um, or, you know, well, really only the employees because they are in private rooms. And then we um, would segregate those patients into another unit that um, is, you know, does not have the COVID patients. So the you know, one side of the building is really for those COVID patients, as I mentioned, that you know, we want to separate them as much as possible. And then on the other side of the hospital is the patient who, um, who you know, doesn't require that kind of isolation. That The reason why we did that, because the protective equipment works, so I don't want there to be a misperception that, you know, if you were to be in a room next to a patient who has COVID positive, that you'd be at a higher risk. The protective equipment works. Um, and uh, and we're, we're seeing that uh, at our hospital. Um, our employee health is is very doing very well. I know that we've heard horror stories in other countries of employees falling ill with the, with the disease. I think we've done a great job of protecting our employees through the PPE. So I would say that folks could really rest easy knowing that, that they're safe, and the people taking care of them are safe, and um, that they should definitely get those procedures done. That's good advice, uh, Melody. I, I know um, the protocol right now, uh, even for non-clinical people, when we come on the campus, 
The first thing is our temperature is checked to yep. make sure that we are not uh, have a fever. Mm -hmm. Secondly, we have to sanitize our hands. And then, and then thirdly, we have to we have to don a mask. And so, every person who comes in, even with the limited visitation, yeah. every employee, every person who comes in has to follow that protocol. And so that's um, that's really been um, kind of a new normal for us. That's just part of our operating now. So one of the questions we have is, what is the new normal going to look like when people get back to work and school? Will they have to don a mask? Will they be sanitizing hands? What what do you foresee? Um, I would say. Uh, you know, we'll have to see what our local authorities say about that. I yeah. would say for, for the short term, we, we are not anticipating easing up on that anytime soon. Okay. Uh, we're, you know, we really feel like our numbers are slowly trending downward. Uh, we're definitely at a plateau state. Um, but we, you know, our goal is to get, get rid of this altogether. Yeah. So I would say um, for for the foreseeable future that we do not anticipate um, our, our change in that in that position until um, at which such time um, non-infectious disease and local authorities uh, were to all come together and, and recommend that we can make that change. Thank you. Uh, Dr. DeLisi, thanks for joining us. I know that you, you have multiple appointments all through the day. I know you're just getting Apologies off. Apologies for being a couple no, minutes late here. No worries, Dr. DeLisi. Uh, I know you're double, triple booked all day. It's like you're still in practice. Uh, <laughs> But uh, as we transition from Melody to Dr. DeLisi, the Chief Medical Officer here at Virginia Hospital Center, um, we talked last week about um, the Gilead Science trial, and uh, and then um, also it was announced, and we didn't have time to talk about it last week, but um, that Virginia Hospital Center was selected to participate in the Covalescent Plasma Initiative that's being led nationally by the Mayo Clinic. Can you share some details around that? Yeah, so um, we have, uh, I think since we, we all spoke a week ago, we've enrolled our first patients into the remdesivir trial for Gilead. So we're really excited about that. Uh, you may have seen in the news, I think the stock futures on Gilead went up uh, uh, really high last night based on some comments that uh, someone in uh, one of the Chicago hospitals made about what they were seeing with remdesivir. So we're watching the patients closely. They got the drugs. Uh, we already, I think, have a couple patients on uh, the trial. and. Uh, we'll continue to monitor that, but again, uh, I said it before, it's something we're really proud to be part of. There's only about 150 sites worldwide that are getting the remdesivir to be able to offer to patients. So uh, it is through a clinical trial, but we're really, really excited that we can offer that uh, to some of the patients that are here with COVID. Uh, convalescent plasma. So what is that? What does that mean? It's it's kind of a uh, I kind of think of a, a long word or a couple words there. They really mean it, you find somebody that had COVID, you find that person that, that has had COVID, but the, we know that they're over it, uh, that they're asymptomatic. We can prove that they're uh, not positive for COVID. And then you check their antibodies. And hopefully if their antibody titers are high enough, meaning they have antibodies that will fight the COVID, um, we can take one of those patients and if they're willing, they can donate blood to the American Red Cross and then Red Cross can take off plasma, which is the part of the blood that contains those antibodies. And then we can get that back to a patient that is, whose body's not fighting off uh, COVID really well. So we're really excited about that. We've had a, a couple people just um, as early as kind of last night that uh, were being tested um, for the antibodies. And uh, we're actually hopeful we got one patient that we are hopeful we'll be able to give some plasma to um, as early as today. So. Uh, again, it's, it's something we, we really try to do here is to stay kind of ahead of the curve with things like the remdesivir trial, the convalescent plasma, getting that Abbott uh, rapid test for COVID-19. Um, and we're just, we're really excited to be able to offer these treatment modalities to our patients. Um, and we're going to keep our fingers crossed that, that some of them work, you know, just kind of echoing what Melody said is, you know, what what is normal going to look like? Uh, I don't think normal really exists until we have either a treatment or a vaccine for this. Um, because no matter, uh, it, you let up on social distancing, people start congregating, uh, unless there's literally zero virus burden, this, this can and, and very well may spread again. So uh, we're really hopeful that something uh, can be sort of seen as a kind of definitive treatment modality for this, uh, or we're gonna have to be waiting for the vaccine, you know, in the next, hopefully 12 months, but we'll see. 
Thanks, Dr. DeLisi. Uh, just somebody just texted in and asked, um, you know, there's a, a lot of activity going on around campus. Uh, got a big hole over here next to the Women's and Infants Building. Um, has COVID-19 affected the hospital's plans in any way as far as expansion or new configuration of, of clinical space? Uh, no, it's not. The governor did cite that um, construction is considered a necessary okay. uh, uh, business, and so we are continuing with that, um, especially on the inpatient side, the 4A construction, which is our new med surge floor. Um, you know, especially if we're thinking about potential for another surge this fall. Um, fall is always a busy time. The seasons change and more patients tend to get ill and, and whatnot anyway. Um, I think now more than ever is when we need those additional 21 beds um, with the, the uh, additional COVID burden coming into the emergency department. Um, you know, it's just really not acceptable to have patients holding uh, in that area, um, we, we need to be able to move them out. And so that additional bed space will um, certainly allow us to do that. Um, I think that Dr. DeLisi and I both would say that um, it, it is the outpatient things in this hospital that um, have us having a lot more people come in uh, uh, than, than we would even need to have had we moved those things out. So for all those reasons, I think that um, it's important to keep these um, the outpatient pavilion and the 4A projects going on as, as planned. That's good to hear. And we know that many, many people associated with the foundation um, are very excited about those projects. This is a two part question. Um, one, and I guess this is probably being um, stimulated by the fact that we're we, there's been discussion about reopening, reopening the economy, reopening society. So, and then the risks, uh, what makes up a what makes somebody to be in a high risk population? What, what determines high risk? Because those are the people that are still being encouraged to be very cautious once we quote open back up. So how do I know if I'm in the high risk population? So, you know, I think um, there's certainly some trends we've seen with the patients that have gotten the most sick, um, certainly older patients. So, I mean, I think the majority of our hospitalizations have been in, in patients over the age of 50. And that ramps up on every decade of, of age. Um, certainly, most of the sickest patients were over that age and um, had um, various comorbidities, so heart disease, uh, chronic lung disease, malignancy. So all of those things uh, would make somebody a little bit more susceptible um, to having a, a poor outcome from, from COVID. Uh, and then across all ages, we've seen um, uh, obesity and morbid obesity also correlated with uh, worse outcomes from COVID. Uh, so I think a lot of the, um, uh, a lot of those risk factors are what a lot of us sort of know anyway, right? If you've got chronic diseases, you're going to be at higher risk to get something like this. You're, you're not going to, you're not going to want to get it. Um, the other thing I'll say too, just in, in what the new normal looks like, the other thing that's developing rapidly are these antibody tests to COVID. We don't exactly know what to do with them today, but um, three weeks ago, we didn't have any rapid testing. So where we'll be in three weeks is, um, it's kind of exciting to think about because things have moved so quickly um, in a lot of really positive directions with the treatment of COVID in the US. So, um, you know, one of the hopes is that you can start testing people for that uh, antibody to say, hey, you've had it and you're now immune to COVID. And so that, that may change who, you know, who can social distance, who can, who's, who's immune, who's gonna spread it and who's not. Um, we don't know how that's going to all hash out yet, but I think in the next couple of weeks, we're going to see a lot of information on that. Thank you. Um, we had a video uh, chat question of uh, asking, what's our current COVID-19 um, number of positive patients that are physically in-house right now? It's about 72, right? 72, I think, yeah. And so how is that compared to, say, the last 10, 15 days? Oh, it's less. We were 78, I believe, this time last year, uh, last week. So uh, we definitely uh, have seen uh, a slow trend down, um, plateauing, I mean, not significant reduction, but in the right direction, nevertheless. Yeah. And I'll, just, I'll just add, we may actually see that number increase a little bit over the next week because uh, we're going to start testing everybody that gets admitted, uh, I think, as Melody uh, mentioned. So 
when you test everybody, you're gonna find some people that are positive that you didn't know about, which is why we're doing the testing, um, but that may um, impact your number a little bit. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's spreading more in the, uh, in the area. But one of the things that our, I know all of our teams are really focused on too is making sure we understand what that surveillance data tells us so we understand what the prevalence of COVID is in our Arlington community. I would say that um, it last, as of yesterday, we were still at 75% of those that were tested were negative. 70, 75%. Yeah. So, so three out of four people that are being tested are negative. So that, that's a good trend. Those are, those are people that you think have it. So 75% yes. of the people that you think have it. So they're showing didn't actually yes. have it. Yeah. So, so we've screened them and we determined that there's a need to test and, and even of that smaller group, 75% are still negative. Those are all positive trends. Um, we'll, we'll be cautiously optimistic. So we've got, Dr. Delisi, we've got a lot of people intrigued with the research that's going on here at Virginia Hospital Center. You know, many people think of us as a exceptional community hospital. It's all about clinical care, putting the patient first. But, you know, you made a decision, you were part of the leadership team that made a decision five years ago to, uh, when you got the invitation, to join the Mayo Clinic Care Network. And that obviously opened up a whole new opportunity for our, our physicians and ultimately for the community to benefit. So there's there's questions here about, the, you know, how what are we doing um, from specifically from a research perspective that's different from maybe uh, a, a community hospital that's not part of the Mayo uh, Care Network? Well, certainly getting enrolled in the remdesivir trial, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll credit Mayo. Um, they've certainly put that in front of us. They said, look, you guys are doing great work here. Your clinical and quality data is amazing. You're a five-star hospital, LeapFrog A, LeapFrog Top Hospital. You should do more research. So. We've heard that from our Mayo colleagues uh, quite a bit. And, you know, we've been really obviously focused on providing top quality clinical care for our community and probably not as much on research. Although some, we have some doctors that do some research. Um, you know, we haven't done, uh, we haven't done as much as some. Um, however, you know, I think just hearing that from Mayo kind of gave us all that, that idea that, you know what, we can do this. We're, we're a good hospital. We do good work here. We can. And, uh, we were a little bit opportunistic, I think, with the remdesivir trial. Um, I was able to get in contact with the chief medical officers and through some people that I know of Gilead, and I said, "Let's let's do this." And uh, we uh, we pushed it really hard, and uh, we had a team that uh, you know we just appointed real quickly. Uh, you know, I think one of the things that's great about our organization is that people are willing to help out to do whatever it needs to you know be done in the moment. And so we took a couple of people whose job isn't to be a clinical research trial coordinator and said. Your job is to be a clinical research trial coordinator and get trained and, and to be able to uh, implement the study. So um, there's actually quite a bit of manpower behind getting the remdesivir trial uh, stood up. Um, but we did it. We got in, uh, I think, at the right time. If we'd been any later, I don't think we would have been able to get into the trial. Uh, and, you know, the result is we're, again, we're one of about a, only 150 uh, sites, including Mayo Clinic. Um, that are part of the remdesivir trial. So it's something we're really excited about. I think it was a great proof of concept for us that we could do something like this and handle it. And uh, we'll see what, what uh, you know, what, what lies in the future. But, uh, you know, I, I certainly think about those comments from Mayo and was thinking about those comments from Mayo when we were sort of making some decisions on uh, whether to go forward with this remdesivir trial. Thank you. We have a question here, a very specific question. A patient with lupus um, chatted in. Um, concerned about um, the access to hydroxychloroquine, which they use. Um, they're concerned if, if um, there's going to be issues with them be having access to that drug. Do you, what do you see? Well, you know, I'll say that I know that the medical, um, the Virginia Department of Health issued um, uh, a letter to all physicians in the Commonwealth sort of advising them that, you know, it's not an evidence-based treatment for COVID-19. And, um, you know, to save it for people, you know, exactly like who, you know, whoever asked the question, right? There are a lot of people that take Plaquenil for various reasons. Um, you know, I can tell you that the, the, I know there are a lot of comments made in the press about Plaquenil, um, but there is no real evidence that it works. Um, there was one very small study um, out of Europe, I think with about 26 people, six of them uh, died. and. It was, it was not a great or well done study. There are trials going on across the country to measure its efficacy. 
Um, we've certainly given it to some people, but um, you know, I think we're pleased with where we are with our uh, supply of, of plaque metal. And Melody could comment on that, but um, you know, we're our infectious disease doctors, our other physicians on the medical staff, and you know, me and just even my review of, of what's going on. Um, I'm not sure it's the uh, it's the silver bullet. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll say one of the things that's um, you know, social media and the internet. Um, you know, what we're seeing, and, and I'm sure this is in nursing too, but the medical societies are, are very connected nationwide. So ID doctors across the country are talking to ID doctors across the country every night on their message boards. And we hear a lot about that um, from our doctors. And, you know, they're talking to their colleagues around the country to find out what works, what doesn't work. Um, and even some of the subtle treatments or um, the subtle ways of treating these patients has changed over the last couple of weeks. Again, as we've seen little pieces of information to come out my own guess is that if Plaquenil was, was the magic uh, drug to treat COVID-19, we'd probably know about it by now. Certainly. Uh, and uh, so I, I don't think there's probably too much to worry about. I think the excitement is, is dying down pretty quickly in the medical community. Yeah, and ID stands for infectious disease docs, just um, yeah, I'm sorry, yeah. for the non-clinical folks. But um, so we had another question. And um, is there any, uh, with, the question is, what is maybe the most unexpected symptoms that we've learned about through testing or through patients presenting COVID-19? Is there anything that really surprised anybody uh, from any of the patients that we've, that we've um, admitted? Or tested? The, only, the only odd symptom that I've heard, and I, I heard this from a couple of patients directly that had it was the, uh, um, uh, the losing of smell. Yeah. Uh, so that's real. Taste and smell. Uh, taste mm -hmm. and smell go away. So, uh, but I've talked to a couple people that have that. So I, and that's that's because it, it it actually sets up deep in the olfactory system and where the sense of smell. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure the exact mechanism of action. But okay. yeah, it's, uh, and that's the oddest symptom in this whole yeah. thing. Melody, is there any, um, any before we um, say goodbye for today, is there anything else you'd like to add um, specifically around our staff or uh, patient stories or anything that you care to share with us? Uh, no, I just, I think it's been, um, really heartwarming to see, um, just the response of the community to the changes that we've made and, uh, and to see our nurses and physicians advocate for specific examples of when we need to bend the rules and, and, uh, applying that, um, very carefully and, uh, with the, the patient and the, and the organization as a whole's best interest in mind. Um, I, I continue to be amazed at how um, well um, uh, everyone in this community has come together through this. Uh, it just makes me very proud to be here and a pr proud to be a part of this organization. Thank you. I, I just wanna close out today by saying a special thank you from uh, the Virginia Hospital Center Foundation. We've had the pleasure of talking to uh, individuals and companies that have been able to give hundreds of thousands of dollars to support our effort, all the way down to a young girl who did a social distancing lemonade stand and raised $60. And we've had everything in between. It's all been very heartfelt and we're very, very appreciative. We wanna thank everybody for joining us this week. If you'd like to learn more about what we're doing, please join us at www.bhcfoundation.com forward slash COVID-19, COVID-19. Uh, for additional information and ways that you can help. Thank you so much. This is the end of our health huddle. Stay safe and stay healthy, everybody. Thank you.